Galatians chapter 3. We're down in verse number 15 this evening. And I'm going to read through this passage. And we'll pray. And then we'll dive in and look at it verse by verse, phrase by phrase. And see how it's applicable to our lives tonight. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 15. The Bible says, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. In this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ... The law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it's no more promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. Shut up into the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. We might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. We're going to look at and see how these verses, these 11 verses tonight, talk about the promise of faith. The promise of faith. But we'll jump into that. Let's ask the Lord's blessing now as we study. Lord, thank you again for the privilege to open your word. Help us as we study. Open our hearts, our minds to receive what you would have. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, last week, uh, we saw that uh, Paul begins to make a, a case uh, for the faith of the gospel towards these Judaizers. We looked at the family of faith specifically. And he talked about how... These Judaizers are coming in and saying, you got to follow the law in order to be saved. But what about Abraham? Remember, the whole last week's uh, thought was about Abraham. And, and Abraham was around before the law. You're, you're holding him in high esteem. Remember, he trusted by faith. And we're saved the same way. What he does now uh, in, in this passage uh, is he begins to discuss and, and, and talk with them about something that he imagines they're probably bringing up. How many of you like to uh, have a good discussion, debate, argument? <laughs> the different ways to say it, depending on who you're talking with, right? I, I'm, I like those things. I like to discuss it. I like to see points of view and then try to prove my side, right? Got to hold strong. What Paul is doing is almost playing, I, I've never understood why they call this, but he's playing the devil's advocate for a moment. Why is it called the devil's advocate, by the way? I've always wondered that. But anyway, he's, he, he's probably thinking, okay, here's what they're going to say about what I uh, He had just, he, they understood that Abraham, all his descendants before Moses came, were saved by faith. Right? We already covered that. They knew that. But then Moses came. And what did God do? He gave the law. So, their conclusion perhaps would have been, okay, Abraham and all those people were saved by faith, but then God gave the law. So, obviously, God wouldn't have given it if that wasn't enough. Hmm, you think about that? If Abraham and believing by faith was enough, then why did God give the law? And so, he's going to answer that question before they ask it. All right? And that's what this passage is talking about. That's why he keeps going back to the law and faith and Abraham and justification and work. How do we do this? If you think about that, that line of reasoning, some of you already even saw you. Oh, yeah, that's true. What about the law then? If Abraham and all his descendants were saved by faith, then why did we bring the law into, into play in the first place? 
why obviously it's either a replacement of faith or it's a supplement of faith. So he's going to give three arguments to these questions that haven't even been asked yet. All right? So the promise of faith. The first answer that he gives, why do we have the law? Number one, he wants to talk about the reliability of the covenant. When we're talking about the covenant tonight, we're talking about the promise that God made to Abraham. We showed that last week. In Genesis 12, all families of the earth will be blessed because of you, all by faith. The reliability of the, the promise of the covenant. He shows how reliable it is. First, he talks about man's promise in verse 15. He says this, it gives an illustration. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant. What's up? Covenant, a promise, an, an arrangement, a pact together, a, a binding contract. And the illustration is that when a contract or agreement is made by people, uh, no one can add to it or take from it. All right, it's going to remain as it was originally made. Then it gives the importance of it. It gives the illustration of the importance of it. The end of verse 15. Yet if it be confirmed... No man disannulleth or addeth thereto. If you made a covenant, man between man, and everything comes true from it, you can't add to it later. You can't change it later. I mean, you have kids that probably have tried to do that a time or two. No, I promise this, but I want to change that. Obviously, you can't do that. And what he's saying is, how much more will God honor his word when he makes a covenant? It gives this illustration. You guys understand a man's covenant is binding. How much more is a covenant that God gives? Uh, God cannot lie. God is immutable, which means he never changes. Therefore, if God promised something, it's not going to be changed. Okay, he's setting the stage here. Reminder. Why do we have the law? That's the question he's answering. He said, hold on. First of all, remember the covenant he made with Abraham. God made this covenant. He can't lie. He's not changing. This is still in effect. All right? Man's promise illustrated. Then we see God's promise imputed in verse 16. Talking about the Abrahamic covenant. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said, look. God promised this. God promised to bless Abraham. God promised in Abraham and in his family, all nations would be blessed. That's unconditional. That's his promise. The, the covenant was specific. Uh, the, the same way he gave uh, the promise of Jesus coming. But we'll get to that in a little while. The idea here, again, we're going to get to the, the law specifically in just a moment. But he's answering the question... If Abraham stayed by faith and all the seeds afterwards, then why, a little bit later, did the law come to Moses? He's saying, first of all, remember that covenant he made with Abraham. It's not of none effect anymore. God promised it. It's happening. God loves everyone. God gives everyone the opportunity to be saved. Believers who lived before the cross maybe didn't know the specifics about Jesus, how he was going to die. But they were forgiven and made right in anticipation, looking forward in faith to the cross. I keep pointing back here because there's a cross on the wall. That's okay. Making sure y'all understand that. And we, and all those who came after Christ's death, were saved by faith looking back to the cross. It's all based on what he did. The promise then was confirmed by Christ. Notice verse 17. And this I say, that the covenant... That was confirmed before of God in Christ. Okay, we got the covenant. That's one side. Now we got the second side. The law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. So he said, you got the covenant God made to Abraham. 430 years later, when Moses came along and God gave the law, that doesn't mean it cancels out the promise, the covenant. That's not what happened. Verse 18, for if the inheritance, the inheritance means uh, salvation or heaven. If the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise. 
Okay? So, he's saying now that the law, or that God gave Moses the law, if that's how you get saved, we don't need this promise anymore. But you can't cancel out this promise because God made it. Alright, so the law is not going to disannul it. The law is not going to make it of none effect. It was confirmed uh, by Christ. Just as God uh, gave it to Abraham, He freely gives it to us. If we believe. And, and we saw a little bit more of that, about that in chapter 2. Well, but let's keep going. This next part is really going to uh, help us. The first uh, idea in the promise of faith was he was looking at the reliability of the covenant. But now he's going to give the reason for the law. Okay? By the way, before we jump into that, that doesn't mean the law is bad. Well, we're saying, don't go to the law, don't go to the law. But that doesn't mean the law is bad. Why did God get... Obviously, there's a reason if God gave it. God gave the law. It's not for us to cling on to and trust in. We're going to see the reason for the law. That's what they thought. If God gave the law, we got to jump all over that. That's how we earn His favor. And he's going to say, no, no. Let me give you the reason. If the covenant to Abraham could not be replaced, then why did God give the law? First of all, I'm only going to give you, I think, two reasons. Yeah, two reasons. Why did God give the law? Number one, to reveal man's need. What do you mean? Let me just read scripture. Verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? Paul does this a lot. He asks the questions that they're thinking. Okay, so what's the purpose of the law, he says? Verse 19. It was added because of transgressions. We're going to get to that in a moment. Let me read another passage of scripture. Listen to these verses. Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay. I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Romans 4.15 Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Here's what he's saying. Why do we have a law? How do you know what's right and wrong without it? Yes, we have conscience. But that's very, uh, people's consciences are different these days. It's unconscionable what people say and think these days. So we can't necessarily just rely on that. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the law. We have God's word. But he's asking, so why did God give the law? The Bible tells us a few reasons that it reveals man's need. How does it reveal man's need? It show, first of all, it shows our transgression. Skip down to verse 24 for a moment. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Is a schoolmaster. A teacher. The, the one, how about this? The one responsible for care and discipline. Okay? The law shows us we're not enough. If anyone can look at the law, whether that be the Ten Commandments, or whether that be the Judaizers uh, and their religion, which is 600 and some things to do and 400 and some things of not to do. I mean, it's crazy. Whether that be uh, religious actions that people say you must do in order to please God, whatever that law may be. If you can look at that and think, I can handle that. I can do all those things. First off, uh, I want to have lunch with you. And, and maybe that will rub off on me. I can't handle that. I look at that and think, wow, I don't measure up. That's one purpose of the law. To show our transgression. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. We know what is wrong based on that law. Why it was given. Why else was the law given? Or it was, it was given to reveal man's need. What's man's need? Show their transgression. Verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. Notice this. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, 
barely righteousness should have been by the law. What it's saying there is the law cannot give life. If we could have followed this and had life and hope in Jesus, we wouldn't need faith and righteousness. They understood it was a tall task to live up to the law. They understood there was no life there. And he said, if the law had given life, then we wouldn't need this. This law that you guys are holding in high esteem, these churches in Galatia, these Judaizers, you're holding that in high esteem. What life has it given you? It hasn't. Mm -hmm. Romans 3.20 again. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Go ahead. Try to follow it to a T. In Christ's eyes, it's not enough. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. One more thing that the law does to reveal our need. It condemns all men. Notice verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin. You know a verse that says that? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. I think we can all agree. Raise your hand if you're perfect. Better put my hand down as I say that. No, we're not perfect. We're all sinners. The law shows us that. Shows us that we're not enough. So, well, let me give you the, the second reason before we review again. It was given to reveal men's need. That's why the law was given. The reason for the law. But it was also given to reveal the superiority of this covenant. Abraham's covenant. Verse 19 again. Wherefore then serveth the law was added because of transgressions. Notice. Till the seed should come. To whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one. But God is one. Okay. Without getting too confusing. Explain something real quick. And then we'll jump back into what this is. The uh, law made between God and man with Moses. Moses is the mediator. Wow. Okay. You've got the law given by God to a man for the rest of the men. Or you've got a covenant made between God and man. God and Abraham. When the mediator is God himself, much more trustworthy than another man. Okay. The law was temporary though. What I love in verse 19, it says, Wherefore then serve the law? Was that because of transgression? Notice, till the seed should come. Take a guess who that's referring to. Till the seed should come. To uh, Jesus. And to whom the promise was made. Oh, we're making this promise. I'm going to bless you. And by faith, till the seed, Jesus Christ should come. Die on the cross. Purchase uh, our, our, our sin debt. And, and purchase righteousness for us. Once that came, we don't need the law anymore. So, review. Promise of faith. It's a, it's a little bit more, uh, got to use our head more tonight, I know. But we want to get through these verses and there's a lot of truth jam-packed in them. Why do we have a law? If Abraham was enough, then why did 430 years later God give the law to Moses? Well, first off, the covenant, you can't get better than the covenant. God promised it. It's going to happen no matter what. But he did give the law. He gave the law to show us that we're sinners. To show us that we don't measure up. To show us that on our own we can't get heaven. And then he ends with the reception of salvation. So the law doesn't hinder the promise. All it does is enhances the need for salvation. Verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. He said, now you got an option. The law came, shows us that we're sinners. Now you got a choice. You want to believe in Jesus? You want to put your faith in him and what he did to save you on the cross? You get the promise of heaven. You want to try to follow the law? Good luck. You're not going to get anywhere. So we've got the reception of salvation and he, he provides that. Listen to these verses in Romans 3. But now the righteousness of God 
without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. There's a difference. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Wonderful truth. Notice verse 23, though. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. He's saying the law was almost a prison. Finding you. All these rules. All these things you have to follow and do. It's like it's wrapping chains around you. Finding you. Not letting you live your life for God. Because that's all it can do. The law. All it can do is show you how inept and unable we are. But then verse 24. Wherefore. The law was our schoolmaster. To bring us unto Christ. That we might be justified by faith. Uh, right now, over the last year and a half, my children have been homeschooled. And it, it's so funny, my daughter, second grade now, she will bring me uh, her work and have the, and she just, she's very dramatic with her faces and her expression and just said, this makes no sense. <laughs> or she'll say something like, I am so confused. What, what is it, that's exactly what is happening here I can't do this alone the law has me wrapped up religion has me wrapped up having to follow this and do this and make sure I do this and cross all my T's and dot all my I's and do it it has me wrapped up and I'm just in chains I, 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 I don't know where else to go I don't know what else to do as a schoolmaster What's that doing? That's bringing us to Christ. And then we look at the cross. And then we think about what Jesus has already done for us. And he's saying, now all you've got to do, release those chains, put your faith in Christ. Trust in what he's done. By the way, not just for salvation. That's first and most important step. But now as a Christian, after salvation, it's not about doing this and doing this. It's about... Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. I want to do this and do this and live this way now because of what you've done. You've done something in me, and I don't want to get over that. I want to for you. I want to, I want to follow these things. I want to live my best for you now because of what you've done. And again, we're still looking to the cross. We're still looking to Christ. That's right. The gospel still plays an effect today. The gospel's not over at salvation. The gospel, the, the fact that he loves me, the fact that he died for me, the fact that he rose in victory for me, that influences my daily living now. It shows us the law where we fell short. And then finally, verse 25. But after that, faith has come. We're no longer under schoolmaster. I love how he concludes that section. We don't need this schoolmaster anymore. We don't need that law. We got Jesus. So to sum it up, I'm going to close my Bible to prove that I'm going to sum it up. <laughs> Once we place our faith in Christ, there's no more need for, again, for a, a schoolmaster. He's going back. He started the chapter saying, Abraham, look to God by faith. Perhaps they're thinking, okay, then why did we get the law later? Good question. Let's look at that covenant. That can't be broken. So let's bring in the law. It shows us that we're sinners. It shows us that we need help. It chains us up in bondage so that we look to Christ. But by the way, that was before Christ came. Now that Christ has come, we don't even need it anymore. Don't need that law. We can get rid of the works of the law in order for us to maintain our position in Christ. Romans 6.14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? For ye are not under the law, but under grace. I love these verses in Hebrews 10, 15 to 18. Just listen and we'll pray. Wherefore the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. 
listen to this, I will put my law into their hearts. And in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there's no more offering for sin. And that doesn't sum it up. He says, I, I'm, not only am I going to get rid of the law, I'm going to give them the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to put inside their heart what's right and wrong. Now we can trust the Holy Spirit. Now we can trust God's Word for, to, to give us direction. We don't need a man-made law. And their sins and iniquities, he says, well, I remember no more. This is the promise of faith. You're going to be commended tonight. Stuck through it. A little bit more of, of teaching with that. But very applicable to us. Don't let religion, don't let works bind you. Never get over what Jesus has done. And how putting our faith in Him is always enough. Let's bow our heads and hearts together in prayer.